Hi, Phil Croshaw here from Passions and in this episode we're going sailing. Okay, and a very warm welcome to this episode of Passions. Uh, and I'm delighted today to be joined by Richard Lehman. And uh, Richard is from tallships.org. So before I actually speak to Richard and get some insight and ideas and inspiration from him, uh, what I'd like to do is just play you a clip about tallships.org and what they do and what they're about, which I think will set some good context for the interview. So uh, let's see what this has to say. Three quarters of a million disadvantaged young people in the UK are not in employment, education or training. Most think they have no chance left in life and many move into drugs, violence and crime, feeling excluded with no hope. Our mission is to take them to sea and change their lives forever. We know that we can make a real difference to society. We want everyone in the UK to have a chance in life. We teach essential life skills. Our classrooms just happen to be ships. We build lasting self-esteem, boost confidence and improve communication skills. After just one voyage, their outlook improves dramatically, transforming their chances in life. Nearly all go into education, employment or training. What we do really works. At age 13, my father passed. And at 16, my mother became heavily incapacitated after suffering an accident. I failed the majority of my exams and I was moving into a world fueled on drugs and violence. My voyage really allowed me to leave all that behind and build a new successful life. When I was five, uh, I was taken away from my parents and put into care. Alongside that, I was put into a new school and they bullied me for being different. And it was found a year later I was dyslexic. So it made school really hard. And then I found tall ships and it changed my life, taught me skills that I needed in life, which I didn't have before. When I was about nine, my family was violent. It wasn't a very good household. 14, I was living uh, homeless on the streets, living on the beach. 15 had my first conviction, my mum was involved with drugs, but now I've got involved with Tall Ships Youth Trust, honestly it changed my life completely and don't get involved with the police anymore. Working with local and national support groups throughout the UK, we can reduce drug abuse, inner city violence and knife crime. Young offenders, or those on the edge of crime, can see a real change in their attitudes and their prospects after just one voyage. Tall Ships can be part of the solution so the major problem we have with young people who are disengaged. The difference in our young people after a week at sea is staggering. So you take them completely out of their environment and into a different environment which helps their character development massively. The voyages are incredible, they're transformational really. What can be achieved on tall ships in five days would take me about six months probably on land to be able to achieve with these young people, it has such a high impact. We can make a lasting difference to society. We know that we can give young people hope, but we need to support more of them each year if we're to make a real impact. We get no government funding, so need to grow our own fundraising. And that is where you can help. Absolutely amazing. Uh, a wonderful short video there that I think captures the reality of some of the challenges that are being faced and the and the work that they're doing at Tall, at tall Ships. So, Richard, thanks very much for joining me today. Why don't you give us a, a, an overview of who you are and what you do at Tall Ships? Um, well, I'm, I'm the chief exec. Um, my job is to uh, make sure the organisation uh, raises money uh, to do what we do. Uh, that we spend that money wisely, we don't waste any, 
and that we achieve the absolute maximum results for our young people that we take out to see and we do it in a in a safe way so it's it's a you know it's a classic ceo role look after the money make sure the the product the service is is a good one and over time grow grow the organization goodness me the need the need out there for our work is is massive and it's grown incredibly over the last few months so uh we have a we have an obligation to to grow uh, as, as soon as we can and as quickly as we can yeah no absolutely as a slight aside it was interesting when i watched that clip how i was looking longingly at the sea and the sun <laughs> as if it was some kind of weird thing you know um so okay so uh tell me about your background and, and and obviously this is about passion so what would you say how do you how would you capture what your passion is and how it links into what you do now well yeah my, my background i i had 35 years in the navy uh commanded ships and groups of ships uh and actually throughout that time uh, none of the achievements uh, of the ships or the groups, uh, or anything I had anything to do with, was was actually down to me. It was it was down to the the amazing people who worked for me and the fact that all of them grew and developed and took on responsibility and had ideas and innovated and created and felt like they were responsible and that they could make mistakes. So it it was a period where I could see the power of, of developing people. Uh, and as I left the Navy and, and went on to, to guide dogs for the blind, uh, I, I thought it'd be quite a difficult transition, but as it, as it turned out, it was exactly the same, the same challenge that you know, people who've lost their sight, it's, it's, it's a disaster. Uh, and it, but taking them from that ultimate low of having lost their partner Mo most partners leave blind people within a few months of, of sight loss having lost their job then their health then their mental health as well as their their sight we we were taking people from a, a very very low point in their lives and through get getting them out with a dog or with a, a white cane or or with a, a sighted guide we were growing them we were helping them develop build their confidence and, and allowing them to regain their their life and and to grow their life, and yet again now at Tall Ships, I'm I'm working with some pretty um, pretty tough youngsters, and they've had the worst start in their lives. Some of them are uh, abused uh, mentally or physically. Quite a lot of them have got involved in youth crime, drug abuse. Uh, one or two of them, you know, we, we find on the streets or on the beach. Uh, m quite a lot have been excluded from school. You know, the, these are kids who've had a really bad start. And and what we do, and what gives me what what my you know how it fulfills my passion, is that I see these youngsters growing and developing in the course of a a voyage uh, un under sail uh, with us. And you know. 97% of these kids go on into education employment or training and that you know that that so that's just the most wonderful thing to do for for them but also immensely satisfying for us because we're the ones who who create that experience and give them the chance to do that it's it's interesting that because when I was just when I was just checking you out in terms of ready for the interview I just made the link or made the assumption that the passion was the sea and that the tall ships had been the way that you'd kind of released some of that passion. But as I talk to you, it seems as if it's more about helping people and making a difference. And is it fair to say, or is it, is it fair to assume that whatever charity you were working with that was making a difference to other people's lives, that would be part of that passion? Or do you think it's only certain charities that would create that deep passion? Does that well, make sense? A, yeah, it's a good question. I mean, <clears throat> just just to take your point about the sea, um, it, it has been a, a, a thread, and the you know, this country in particular is known for hundreds of years that if you take young people out to sea, they come back as young young adults. So there there is a linkage there between my my career 
in the navy and and, and this job but as you say yeah. the common thread is 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 developing uh developing hu human beings um i've i've often thought about other opportunities um to to try and help people develop and other charities to to work within and you know to, to be honest there are there are quite a lot of charities that are dealing quite rightly with the environment um with uh, <clears throat> medical uh, research and so on and so forth but but for me the you know the human contact seeing someone um i either just an uh, just a normal person and seeing them grow within my own organization part of this is about seeing my own team grow in 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 my organizations or seeing someone in a bad place and seeing them get over that and and grow again yes that is that is the thread and it, and it is incredibly rewarding um i'm not a i'm not a white savior it's not me that saves these people it's it's the humans who are doing it themselves and that's what's so remarkable about about this work yeah no i can i can absolutely see that i think it would be um I think it's important as we as we're, we're doing this interview at the moment on the in effect on the twelfth of November, but actually slap bang in the middle of the second um, um, lockdown, which it makes me smile a little bit. So three four years from now, if people are watching this, they'll be thinking, "What what's a lockdown?" You know, some people might be thinking, "What's a lockdown?" But um, I, I think it'd be interesting to explore to what degree the COVID situation has impacted on you the charity and the work that you do because i, I know we've mentioned briefly off air that it's been a challenging year mm. so just just talk me through some of the challenges that it's been that have been created as a result of what's been happening in the last 12 yeah. months or so yeah well, we're, yeah we're we're, we're not un, unusual phil the um like, like most charities it, it's been a it's been a tough time like most businesses it's been a really tough time uh we we've had a particularly interesting journey in in the uh, the guidelines have prevented us from putting young people in groups together um and of course that that kind of kills the idea of taking them out to sea for a week so we've actually had to to come to a grinding halt uh, now that with it brings a grinding halt to to our traditional sources of of fundraising and support from grant giving bodies so it's actually been a pretty murderous six months particularly as government grants have been going to organizations dealing with covid today and uh we are not dealing with covid today but here here's the the, the thing we, we are determined to get through to the other side of this because what's going on with our particular group of young people at the moment the vulnerable and disadvantaged is things are getting worse so it was already bad before march uh we're now seeing increased uh, rates of mental illness of abuse within their so-called families and uh, the <coughs> demand for our work has risen exponentially and so we have to be here the other side of this this uh, disaster uh, and so all my work over the last few months has been to uh, reduce our cost base to uh, try and raise money from alternative sources and to say to the government we really, really do need to address this particular group of youngsters who have been the worst hit by this this lockdown and who you promised in your manifesto to level up, to support, to unleash their potential. And you know, I, I'm, I've been working very, very hard to, uh, to demonstrate that the way we will be sailing is safe and the need is, is unimaginable. And we really must get on with it. So it's it's, been, it's actually been quite a uh, quite a tough period financially, but also quite challenging getting the message across to government, who clearly you know they've got massive priorities and a whole load of things to worry about. But actually, in terms of the not just the political landscape, but the human landscape, this group of young people, we really, really should be focusing on right now. Yeah, no, I mean, absolutely. W would you say that it's, I mean, you're obviously would be and are very frustrated about the situation, which is totally understandable. Is there any, do you think there's any correlation between the depth of your very clear passion for what you do and what you're doing for those people? Do you think that there's any connection with that 
depth of passion and that frustration that you can't do what you need to be doing yeah i, I mean for, i i i wouldn't necessarily um i suppose i am frustrated but what what that passion does is it drives me to find <laughs> solutions and answers so in our particular case we've we've now got a rapid COVID testing kit. Um, it is 100% reliable. The national test is only 80% reliable. It's 100% reliable on day one of infection, and it takes 40 minutes. Now, the, the solution we've generated is that we can test the young people on the jetty with this rapid test. We put the COVID-free youngsters on the vessel, which has already been sterilized, and then we can take them to sea perfectly safely for a week, knowing that we've excluded those who have the infection. Now, this this is a solution. This is an answer to, <coughs> excuse me, not just our challenge, but actually many organizations, commercial organizations who are trying to gather groups of people together. This is a solution waiting to be taken up by government who are applying guidelines that were written before this technological breakthrough and who are um, in my opinion quite slow to adopt it as a way of learning to live with covid so yes there is there is frustration but what the passion does it it it, it makes us all think okay we can't do exactly what we want to do how are we going to get there how can we create or innovate or do something different so that we can help people or we can um save the planet but whatever our passion is. Yeah, I, I, I can totally see that. And that makes an awful lot of sense. And, um, you know, I think that the passion, the passion clearly exudes from you. You know, some people, it just, you can just, the minute you start talking, they just kind of take on a different mantle altogether. Um, <clears throat> so is it, in terms of, obviously, so you managed to make a career. I think it's fair to say you've managed to make a career out of, of this passion. Um, what's how was what was the journey to that point? Is it something you had mapped out? You know, we had almost like a, 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 you know shaking your head here. So uh, um, you know, like a planned approach to it. You had various different goals and milestones and everything else, <laughs> or did you just fall into it like from the sky, like Mister Bean? <laughs> how did it? How did it? Un how did it? Uh, turn, you know? Well, a mixture of both, really. I, I'm, you know, <laughs> uh, the. I, as a teenager, I was uh, in a rock band, um, long hair, aiming to be something like Genesis or King Crimson or something like that. You know, um, uh, I sort of almost fell into the Navy and uh, I went there because I could travel the world and, and see great places. And it was all a bit sort of uh, gung ho and dashing. Um, so not at all for the, for the right reasons, not even to defend my country, but fairly shortly after I got there, I realized that was, was what it was about. Um, there was no, no mapping, no intent. I had no idea that this was what, um, would end up being my sort of life's, um, am ambitions. But what I did discover very early on, uh, and it was taught to me rather than me looking for it was that if, if I genuinely took an interest in the people who worked with me and, and for me um, and helped them to develop, uh, just the most amazing things happened. And quite often as a, as a young officer and then as a commanding officer, I, I, I would end up literally having to physically do nothing because the people around me had had grown and blossomed and were taking on taking on responsibilities and coming to me with the ideas and uh you know very rarely in command did i ever give an order it would have been to fire a weapon to to um you know to, to deliver uh, uh explosives or uh it would be to avoid a collision or something that you know i could see was was on its way because otherwise the the whole idea was that these people who had developed and been empowered and and had been trusted uh, were running the entire organization. I was just occasionally moving the baton and conducting the orchestra. And, and so over time, it became more and more obvious that the power of the human spirit, the power of human beings to learn and to grow is incredible. And if you know, when, when we harness it, 
it, it's, it, it can change the world. I think what's really fascinating about that is I often find, and I've been interviewing lots of people for quite a few years now, and I very often find that um, great leaders quite often just shrug as if they just do it. Do you know? You know, it's yeah. kind of like, well, I just tell them what to do, or you know, I just, I just make sure that they're all okay and they do the best work. And but yeah. of course, it's not, it's not really like that, is it? That the skills needed to be a great leader. I don't and know what put that, yourself in this. I mean, no, you know, I wouldn't. I, would, I wouldn't put myself in in that category. That and that would be that, that would be bad leadership. The the um, uh, you, you're right. My best leaders. I, I used to look at them and think, how on earth did he or she do that? <laughs> yeah. It made me want to to cry when when they said I'd let them down, or why was I always working like crazy for this this person? Uh, so the really good leaders, you you don't even know it's happening to you. And if there was a common thread, it was that all of them were they weren't micromanagers. They genuinely took an interest in in me. And they allowed me to, to to grow and to have my to make my mistakes, uh, but also to take risks and 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 make, and make the most of opportunities. So these people were quite the really good ones were quite hands off, but knew exactly when to intervene or when to ask the right question. I, I there's one thread, and I think it is that they took a genuine interest in in me or in 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 their people it wasn't you know how's the wife today john or, or whatever it, it, and, and you know the guy got divorced two weeks before that it, 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 it's a it's it's a real interest and it's one that it, it actually makes people feel blimey this this person really cares about me i i really care whether i i do a, a good good job for them and i actually really care about them too so it's, it's really human it's really human stuff yeah i think the key there as well is really care because I think you can tell, I mean, I, I'm from a corporate background until I started doing my own thing. And uh, I think you really can tell when somebody's, you know, been on a course. Shall they say that they, oh, you've been on a course, didn't they? Yeah. Um, and I think people can really tell genuine caring versus false caring. Would you say that's true? Yeah, and I, I had a, a good good example la last week. We, we've, uh, we've had to put uh, some people on, on furlough um to to keep the the costs down whilst we wait to sail again and i i knew i could see one of them was actually quite upset on the the team video call so i i asked her to stay on and we had a three or four minute chat i just said look i can see you this is affecting you do you want to talk about it and and, and she burst into tears and she's you know she was just so glad that somebody noticed she was uneasy that the chief exec had bothered to Ask her if he could help, and said to her, "You know, you, if there's anything over the next few weeks that you know begins to trouble you, you really need to get hold of me because we will, we will fix this and we'll get through it together." So, for it, and that was I, I was doing it a because I was actually genuinely worried about her, and b because she needed someone to to, to care and to 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 be there, and you know I can guarantee that as we come out of this she she will just be so positive and confident and going for it when she gets well, when she gets back to work so it 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 is partially selfish selfish but it's also you know that genuine interest thing which which really does matter really matters so obviously you've got a lot of experience in leadership being led and leading others um a question that's coming to just come into my mind um do you think that leaders are born or made? Um, the, the, it, I mean, it's a, it's a it's an age old question, uh, I, 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 and I'm not being a politician and avoiding the answer. I think it is it is a combination. I think there are some yeah. people who um, have have it in them, um, and I think there are others who 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 have have to learn it. But wow, this is quite com complex because the, I think there are certain people for whom it comes easy, uh, and they get it, and uh, people will follow them. Uh, I think there are others who have to constantly work at it, and even at the peak of their career, uh, 
you know that they're, they're they're still having to work at it or i must i must genuinely ask someone how they are today and, and really take an interest so that um I, th I think it's there are people uh, across across the spectrum that there's another thread to this though and i do think there's uh there is a need nowadays for quite deep professional competence so i have had and i've seen over time lots of leaders they're very char charismatic um people absolutely love them but i would never go to war with them because their their competence levels were quite low um and 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 so i think there's nowadays there is that human side but if you don't know how to do your job and you're not very very competent the good leadership will only take you so far and and the the other side of the coin is i know some people who are incredibly professionally competent but they're dreadful leaders dreadful with people and their professional competence will only take them so far and then they hit a brick wall because people just simply won't follow them and get the job done. So there is, for me, there's a balance uh, of the two in 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 good leaders, good managers. You know, I think that's a great. I think that's a great point. And uh, interestingly, just thinking about my career, certainly in um, in the, in the past, where it was the classic that the best salesperson got made the sales manager. And that, that was a great example of it. Brilliant salespeople, but of course, there's brilliant salespeople, yeah. very selfish, very self-motivated, very me, me, me. And suddenly yeah. they're the manager and they're absolutely yeah. horrendous. Yeah. And, and you know, I wouldn't, yeah, I wouldn't dream of categorizing um, uh, other, other branches of, of business and, and my world where you, you tend to move up the line because your results, are, you know, your numbers are good. Um, but unfortunately, when you get up the line, because you're not very good at leading and managing, uh, you, you, you be, you're a train wreck because uh, um, because you don't know how to do it. Just doesn't meet meet your meet your skill sets, really, does it? Okay, I could talk to you for for a lot longer, but we're coming to to the end of the time. So, I'm mean, just just one final question then. Um, I talk to a lot of clients when I'm doing business coaching and small businesses and startups and such like about the sacrifices that they might have to consider or they might have to, to make in order to get to where they want to go. Are there situations when you look back through your career where you had to make sacrifices in your life, whether it was time or money or have you got any examples of that? Yeah, I mean, well, you're spot on, Phil, because, you know, you look at any of the sort of quality performers uh, in any field, uh, whether it's business or arts or football, uh, music, uh, all these people to achieve the, the highest levels, they, they have to make sacrifices across the board. In some cases, it, it's physical, you know, to, to, to dance, you, you have to eat carefully and train so hard and, and all that. Um, yeah, I, I don't, and you. I just don't think you you can achieve really high levels of of uh, um, uh, you know results with without some form of sacrifice. For me, blimey, um, I, I, I'm on I'm on marriage number three, which probably uh, either speaks to my personality or to the sacrifices that others have had to make whilst I spent 35 years at sea. Or committed myself to to trying to help help blind people. So, uh, you know, if whenever I I, I speak to young uh, emerging leaders, um, I I try and um, try not to set myself as an example there because I think there is a there is a balance, and I I arguably others that you know I didn't get it get it right. Um, you know how 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 can you possibly um uh sacrifice humans uh and you know your relationships or um your your time which is so precious just for the sake of a of a passion and uh getting that balance right is hard but i do think it's important i really do yeah Even that's too. wonderful Richard, thanks ever so much for that. Absolutely fantastic. So, uh, how do people find out about uh, Tall Ships? Then, is there a website they can go to that can give them more information about it and find out more? Yep. Um, we, we, as you said at the start, it's www.tallships.org. 
Uh, we're on Facebook. We're on LinkedIn. Um, my, my email address is readily available. Uh, if anyone is is interested in us, we we like to get people down to to meet the kids. We'll be running again soon. Come down and meet the kids. Just see see the re- results at the end of their voyages, and uh, it will it will make you cry. And uh, we'll uh, we'll engage you in our work. Well, I have to say, I just think it's a it's an absolutely wonderful cause, and I had to smile to myself actually because uh, I I absolutely love the sea. And yet, put me on a boat for more than five minutes, and I'm puking up over the side. It goes away, Phil. It goes no, away. You, you it? have to keep. You have to keep doing it for two or three days. You feel like death, and then it goes away forever. Right. Let well, that'll check you. my passion. You. That'll check my passion if I can keep throwing up for two or three days. <laughs> Let me show you. Let me take you out, and we'll sort right, it. Right. I would. I would love to. And once we can see the uh, the wood for the trees and 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 the horizon of the sea, over the sea, then I'd love to take you up on that. I think it's a, a fantastic thing that you do, and I think it's interesting, and I think it's obviously dynamic, and I can understand why if they've had a tough start in life that they would absolutely. It must be amazing for them to experience that when they've been in so much um, in so much difficulties and traumas. Uh, I just think it's wonderful. So from, from my perspective, congratulations on what is wonderful. And I, and I very much hope that you can get back up running soon and that we can uh, maybe in 2021, we can look back on this and maybe I can do another interview with you and say, my God, do you remember 2020, <laughs> Richard? It was yeah. a pretty nightmare. So yeah. thanks very much for joining me today and uh, all the very best with what you're doing. My pleasure, Phil. Thank you for having me and uh, keep safe. Thank you.